Welcome students to the section of notes titled Tracing Self-Government. What we're going to be doing is looking at kind of a historical overview on the origins of the U.S. Constitution and political freedoms as a whole. Keep in mind you are taking Cornell notes, which means that you are taking your uh, notes on the right-hand side of the uh, margin, and then after the notes, you're going to write down some main ideas and cues as you review your notes on the left-hand side. At the very end, you're going to create a one-sentence summary to kind of uh, summarize the notes uh, as a whole. Please uh, be sure to uh, be prepared to share in class. Uh, so we're looking at traditions of self-government. The first uh, self-government uh, idea is the Magna Carta which was passed in 1215. Uh, if you remember this from world history, this was a English document that uh, basically got King John to recognize his subjects and to live under a rule of law. Uh, before this time, the kings could pretty much do whatever they wanted, and they had no uh, nobody or no document saying what they could and couldn't do. And so this document is huge it's in the step forward to a democratic uh, republic in that it's the people that are now able to um, create a document that limits the king's power. We also next have the Virginia House of Burgesses, 1619. If you remember, uh, Virginia was established in 1607, and so about 12 years later, they realized that they needed an elective legislature. Uh, this is the example of popular sovereignty. So the very first Congress, if you will, uh, House, Congress, uh, synonymous with each other, uh, this is the first voting body in America. And all subsequent houses uh, in state level and federal level would be based off of this Virginia House of Burgesses. A uh, good way to remember uh, Virginia House of Burgesses. House is Congress. So if you remember legislature, um, that'll help you uh, to remember this the whole idea of popular sovereignty. Uh, next, we have the Mayflower Compact in 1620. And if you remember, the uh, Mayflower uh, had the pilgrims aboard, the separatists that were separating from the English church. They were bound for Virginia, got blown uh, about 90 miles off course up to um, the Cape up there in Massachusetts. And so they had to create their own government. The uh, pilgrims aboard the Mayflower were not prepared to create their own government because they were going to an already settled land. Uh, but now they had to create their own, their own government. So the Mayflower Compact is important because it's the first social contract compact contract, kind of rhymes with each other, uh, which is an agreement to enact just and equal laws for the general good of the colony. Uh, if you remember, the Mayflower did not just have pilgrims, but also had some what they called strangers, some non-Christians, some non-separatists, uh, if you will, that were aboard the Mayflower because they were on their way to Virginia. Uh, but now the pilgrims and the strangers, the non-Christians, have to coexist together. And so before they got off the boat, uh, once they reached the new land in Massachusetts, uh, they create, came up with the Mayflower Compact. Uh, little note here that you don't need to write down, but the settlers consented to follow the rules and regulations of the government for the sake of survival. The government in return would derive its power from the consent of the governed. Basically this uh, workable relationship where the government provides uh, the people with protection while the people themselves provide the government with uh, their service and with their obedience and such. Next, we have the Connecticut Fundamental Orders. And Connecticut is uh, just above Massachusetts, if you know your geography. Uh, this is the first written constitution for Americans. Uh, this is a new state that would break off from the uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, state there, and they would become uh, kind of their own um, colony, and they would need to write a constitution that would separate them from all other colonies. 
So if you remember Constitution, Connecticut, C-O-N, C-O-N, that should help you remember that uh, Connecticut was the first constitution that was written. It wasn't a constitution for all Americans, but it was a constitution for the Connecticut people. And again, would be an example of that uh, other states and the federal government would adopt their own constitution off of. And again, remember that a constitution is a written form of um, how a government rules and how a government governs itself, like we have here in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, you don't need to write this down, but interesting what it said in here is, and well knowing where a people are gathered together, the word of God requires that to maintain the peace and unity, there should be an orderly and decent government established according to God to maintain and preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess of the said gospel, which practiced among us. So as you see right here, the people in Connecticut were very religious and uh, dedicated to uh, this idea of God's sovereignty over the government. Next, we have the Rhode Island colony. Rhode Island would also break off from Massachusetts as Connecticut had. And Rhode Island would become a symbol of religious tolerance, uh, which is kind of a contrast from the uh, quote, quote, intolerant Puritans of Massachusetts. This is a picture right here of Roger Williams, the creator of Rhode Island, and his uh, working in peace with the Native Americans there. Now, part of the establishment of Rhode Island colony and this religious tolerance was out of a very intolerant uh, trial that took place, and that was on the Anne Hutchinson trial. Uh, the Anne Hutchinson trial, she was convict and convicted and banished uh, from Massachusetts for disagreeing with the Puritan church and holding Bible studies at home. Uh, essentially, the Puritans, uh, rulers at that time, did not like women uh, sharing uh, in the church, uh, let alone holding Bible studies at their home. Part of this is because the Puritans uh, wanted to maintain uh, the scriptures and maintain the integrity the purity of the doctrine, uh, but also there was this uh, threat from an outsider, if you will, this threat that this woman, this new teacher might uh, bring uh, different people away from their church into hers, and this power struggle ensued. So she was banished, and she would escape to Rhode Island, but en route uh, would end up uh, falling ill and uh, dying uh, there. So she becomes a symbol, as Rhode Island colony does, of this religious tolerance. Next, we have 1649, the, May the May Maryland Toleration Act. Uh, and with Maryland, we have the freedom of religion for all Catholics and Protestants. Uh, what you should uh, note here is that it's Maryland. Uh, if you know anything about uh, Catholic doctrine, Mary, the mother of Christ, is very important. Uh, she's elevated more than Protestant uh, faiths. And so uh, if you can remember Maryland Catholic, Maryland Catholics, uh, that should serve you well. And you should remember that the Maryland Toleration Act was the freedom of religion for all Catholics as well as Protestants there. Next, we have... 1681 Progressive Pennsylvania. Now, this is not so much of a document or some sort of government that is established, but it's more of a symbol here in the uh, colony of Pennsylvania. William Penn, uh, he was kind of a, um, a venture, a uh, kind of a forerunner, if you will. He treated Native Americans equally, which was not common back then. And so this idea of respecting others and um, such is definitely a characteristic of William Penn. Uh, he believed in nonviolent opposition. So again, another hallmark of this idea of liberty and equality is that you can oppose the government and oppose ideas, but do it nonviolently. Uh, he was a Quaker, uh, and these Quakers were kind of this modern uh, church forerunner in that uh, they rejected predestination, which uh, this extreme predestination of the 
uh, Massachusetts Puritans uh, was very much of a dogmatic uh, God chooses who goes to hell and who goes to heaven, and uh, we really have no say. And so the uh, Quakers would say, no, in Scripture, there is this notion of man being responsible. And so this, this modern idea that we have in many churches today, that man is responsible for his actions, comes from this Quaker movement. Uh, they also rejected rituals of the trained clergy uh, in the Puritan church in Massachusetts. Uh, in order to be a minister, in order to be a pastor, you had to be trained. Uh, you also conducted these rituals, uh, these sacraments, uh, that the Quakers felt like were too closely tied to the Catholic Church. And so they're kind of getting away from that high church uh, and such. Also, they believed in what is called the inner light, which is this um, Holy Spirit uh, quickening, if you will. The reason that they're called Quakers is because uh, they believe that the Holy Spirit quakes you, that you uh, get tremors from the Holy Spirit and from the movement of the Holy Spirit. And so the Quakers, they're very charismatic and very uh, lively group, um, but they're kind of a forerunner, if you will, of, of a modern uh, church that we see today. Uh, we also have 1689, we have the English Bill of Rights. Now, this is going back to England, just like the Magna Carta. Uh, and if you remember, the uh, Glorious Revolution took place in 1689. And out of the Glorious Revolution, James II would abdicate the throne. He was Roman Catholic. He would leave the English throne, and William and Mary would set up their uh, dominion in England. And so as a result of that, we have the English Bill of Rights. The college here in America, known as William and Mary, which is in Virginia, is dedicated to their memory as king and queen and the establishment of the Bill of Rights that they create. Now keep in mind this is not the U.S. Bill of Rights, though the English Bill of Rights would uh, influence the American Bill of Rights. So it ensures the rule of parliament. Uh, that's a picture of parliament building right there, which is the government, uh, which is the people that are voted uh, by and voted on. Uh, this also ensures this freedom of speech, press, religion, and elections. And press, we mean the newspaper and media outlets such as that. Uh, so you see some of the uh, similar things that the U.S. Bill of Rights also endorses. Speech, press, religion, and elections. Next, we have the 1735 New York Zenger trial. Uh, Peter Zenger would be put on trial. Uh, what happens is that Peter Zenger is a newspaper publisher, and he publishes a uh, pretty uh, harsh story about one of the governors of New York. And uh, the governor of New York did not like how uh, he was slamming uh the governor himself uh, so much, and so uh, Peter Zenger would be put on trial. Uh, what happens is that Peter Zenger is actually acquitted. He does not have to pay any fines, and he's seen as uh, not guilty of any heinous crimes because what he printed was true. And so this establishes the freedom of press and this idea that the truth is always a defense of criticizing press, which is called libel. Libel is anything that's a criticizing press. And so basically, if you write something that is true, you're allowed to publish it. If something is not true, you cannot publish it. So uh, the freedom of the newspapers and magazines to publish things about people, even if it's you know kind of colorful and kind of harsh what they're publishing, they're allowed to as long as it is true. Uh, you don't need to write down this quote, but... Uh, Famously, he said, uh-oh, okay. Uh, famously, he said, uh, truth is always a defense of criticizing press. Uh, he said, no nation, ancient or modern, ever lost the liberty of speaking freely, writing, or publishing their sentiments, but forthwith lost their liberty in general and became slaves. Um, so basically what he's saying here is that if you lose your freedom of press, you are one step closer to becoming a slave. And lastly, we have the New York or the New England, not New York, New England town meetings. 
Uh, this is held in every church uh, in every community as a form of direct democracy. Uh, the example below is from the film The Patriot, if you've seen that. Uh, what is happening here is that uh, in New England, uh, each church is the hub, the form of direct democracy, where people are able to voice their concerns and be heard. And so uh, that town meeting, in a sense, uh, would be this form of direct democracy, which America prides itself on, the people being able to speak their mind in local settings. So make sure that you review your notes, place the big ideas in the left-hand margin, also create a one-sentence summary of your notes, and be prepared to share in class. Thank you for taking these notes.